Marsha Pairings with Jeff and Sherry. I'm Jeff Friedlander. And I'm Sherry. And we're glad you joined us. This week's Parsha is called Beishalach, and it means when he let, uh, let go. It begins in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, and goes through 17, verse 6. The Haftor this week is Judges chapter 4, verse 4, through chapter 5, verse 31. And the Brik Hadashah, or New Testament reading, is Matthew 14, 22 through 23, and John 6, 15 through 71. I'm going to begin today by reading out of chapter 16, verse 17. We're going to read all the way through. Chapter 13. Right, that's what I said. Chapter 13. <laughs> it's Parsha 16. It's the 16th Parsha of the year. And so, chapter 13, starting in verse 17. Here we go. After Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not guide them to the highway that goes through the land of the Philistines, because it was close by. God thought that the people, upon seeing war, might change their minds and return to Egypt. What well, sounds like us. Rather, God led the people by a roundabout route through the desert of the Sea of Suf. The people of Israel went up from the land of Egypt fully armed. Verse 19, Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him, for Yosef had made the people of Israel swear an oath when he said, God will certainly remember you, and you are to carry my bones up with you away from here. They traveled from Sukkot to, and set up camp in Etam, at the edge of the desert. Adonai went ahead of them in a column of cloud during the daytime to lead them on their way, and at night in a column of fire to give them light. Thus they could travel both day, by day and by night. Neither the column of cloud by day nor the column of fire at night went away from in front of the people. So this passage has quite a bit to catch our attention, doesn't it, Sherry? Yeah, so the first thing we notice and we pull out of here is that um, the direction that they go. Yeah. Rather than taking the shorter route um, up through the land of the Philistines where they're sure to um, in, in encounter war, God sends them in a more southern route. But what's interesting, this more northern route, later, beca it's a common trade route. Yeah. And it really ne later becomes known as the Via Maris, or the Way of the Sea. Yeah. And it cuts from Egypt all the way up into Israel and back down, and so you can do a trade route, but he didn't take them that way. Yeah. He took them a little more south, which I think in a little bit you're going to tell us about those names. Yeah. Uh, because it says that he took them around the way of the wilderness to the Sea of Reeds. But something else I want to notice, and we've talked a little bit about this, verse 18 lets us know that this was a group that was taken out and they were armed. Mm. That word armed is chumash, and it means in battle array. Yeah. They're arrayed for battle. Um, could be by battles by five, armed. Mm. So why would God not take them into a place of battle when they're arrayed in battle? And the thing that I pull out of that is that even though they're physically arrayed in battle, their hearts are not arrayed in battle. He knows that as soon as they see war, they're going to want to turn back. Yeah, they've got kind of a uh, what we call a slavery mentality mm -hmm. still. They've just been delivered, and it is miraculous, their delivery, right. and yet this is a whole new stretch. This is a whole new way. Mm -hmm. Everything is changing in their world. Moving yeah. it, it like this is dramatic and, in some cases, traumatic. Right. And I think they still have a lot of difficulty. And well, God we're going to see that. And know? at the end of this part, we actually do see what happens when they are engaged in war. Yeah. But and the God other thing that. to note about this, uh, what this, this portion tells us, is that they honored the wish of Joseph. Yeah. So we also see in verse 19 that Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. And what's so unique about this is, remember when, they, when Joseph died, he told them, he said, listen, there's going to be a day when God is going to remember you. God's going to see you, God's going to hear you, and God's going to deliver you out of this land. And when he does, take my bones with you. So apparently this story yeah. has been being passed down from generation to generation to generation. And Moses knows this story. He knows who Joseph is. He knows how they ended up in the land of yeah. Egypt. And he knows the promise that they made to Joseph. So he honors that. And it's this one little verse that says, 
He took Joseph's bones with him. So Joseph is going in the Exodus as well. Yeah, and they spent, it's, a, it's an impressive thing to think about several centuries of passing down the story like this. Yeah. And so the first place they land when they come out of Egypt is a place called Sukkot. And that's a word that means booths or tabernacles or dwe temporary dwellings. And we know much later we're going to learn that this a festival called the Festival of Sukkot or the Festival of Tabernacles mm -hmm. will be instituted. And that festival will be a time that we're going to celebrate, and we celebrate every year, of the return of the Messiah, that he will come and he will dwell with us, and that we're celebrating that we were in a temporary dwelling. It's interesting mm -hmm. that God sends them to this little place called Sukkot, the very first place, as a representative. This is going to be the presence of God, that mm -hmm. God is going to dwell with you. And then they go from there to the next little stop. It's a place called Itam. And Itam means wall, which makes perfect sense because mm -hmm. if you read the scriptures right there, you find out that they're going to look around and they're going to see 300-meter walls above them in mountains. Uh, in front of them is, a, is uh, the, the Red Sea that can go down as deep as a couple hundred meters. And so you have this wall around them and you have this sea in front of them. And certainly this place of Itam is is daunting for them. It's got them kind of uh, scared at this point. But God is with them. Verse 21 tells us that Adonai went before them in the pillar of cloud by yep. day and led them in the pillar of fire by night to give them light so that they were able to travel both day and night, which lets us know that God was putting lots of ground and space between them and Egypt. Yeah. It's not like they camped and they stopped and camped and stopped. He's, he's leading them both day and night to put space between them yeah. and Pharaoh. And so this uh, reminds us also with this cloud of fire, or this cloud by day and fire by night, rem Moses reminds him of this at the end of their journey in Deuteronomy 33 when he's given the final goodbyes to Israel. And he tells us in verse 29, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is your shield and your help? Mm. God is going before them as a shield. Yeah. We see David and Solomon also write about this attribute of God being a shield. In Proverbs 35, it says, Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take yeah. refuge in him. And then Psalm 33, 20 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Yeah. So this this story of the Exodus and this imagery of, of God going before them and leading them and guiding them is something that carries forth to even us today yeah. as followers of Messiah, that he is our shield. It's a beautiful picture because uh, we often think of it having to be a miraculous cloud slash fire, something physical. Mm. And yet what we get to realize is that is what's happening in the invisible realm all around us right. is God is before us, God is behind us, and we have to have eyes to see that. Yeah. Lord, give us eyes to see. We move into chapter 14, Sherry, and Israel's traveling. They're in mountainous terrain. They're in the direction of the cloud, right? And uh, there's a notion that's been created out of this, right? There's a notion that they were the wandering Jews. Mm -hmm. And this idea of a wandering Jew is actually kind of a derogatory term. Right. It's kind of negative. It's, it's this idea that they don't know where they're going. They're just lost. And the truth is, Sherry, you, you found out that's actually not a reality, is it? Right. Well, this notion comes from what Pharaoh's observation is. <laughs> Which is not the best place to take your, your cues. Because Pharaoh <laughs> looks and he goes, oh, look, they're just wandering around. They didn't go in the more direct. Yeah. Path. They're like down here yeah. in this area that makes no sense. They're wandering around, but really they're being led. They are being because led. Because we, as we continue to unfold this story in future Parshas, we're going to see they don't move until the cloud moves or the fire moves. They're yeah. not wandering at all. God is leading them. God's leading them, and that's the key. So Pharaoh's heart gets hardened. He pursues B'nai Yisrael to bring them back into his workforce because <laughs> obviously he needs them. And as the army approaches, uh, they got uh, Israel all hemmed in there. They're pinned on all sides, and they're up against the Red Sea. And in verse 10 of chapter 14, we read, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and saw the Egyptians right there yeah. coming after them. And in great fear, the people of Israel cried out to Adonai. So we see this moment of great fear, and the Hebrew there is kind of fun. They were terrified, and yeah. this word is Yahweh 
which means, and, and actually, it's, it's the word is mayod yare, which is very yeah, mayo, afraid. Mayo. Very afraid. Which very mayo's afraid. a great word. It's a word that means great. It's a word that means exuberance. It's, it's, it's well, it's much. It's much. Lots, yeah. Mayo. So know? they are very, very afraid. And this is not the first time we see this word fear. Yeah. And what's interesting is it can be terrified in this way or a reverence of. You have to look at the context. There's just a few places that we see this. The first place we see it is in Genesis 3.10. After Adam's partaken of the fruit, the Lord, he hears the Lord in the cool of the day and he hides. And he says that when he heard God, he was Yahweh. That's not the reverence. No, he was. This you is know, terror. I wonder if there's not a mixture, though. Oh, he's scared. You death. are God, but I'm also afraid because I know I've disobeyed you. Oh, he's you. scared. He ate the fruit. He's scared. <laughs> then we have uh, Genesis 15. I love this, that Adonai speaks to Abram. And he says, do not be Yahweh. Yeah. What does he say? For I am your shield. shield. There it I'm is your again. shield. Your this, very this concept, great reward. The concept of the shield is the concept that avoids Yare. You don't have the, to be the, afraid. You don't have to be afraid when you know he's your shield. Uh, Genesis 18, we have a record of Sarah laughing after she finds out she's yeah. going to have a baby. And the angel calls her out on it. And she says, no, 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 no I didn't laugh. For she was Yare. She yeah. was afraid. Um, of course, in Genesis 19, Lot was Yare after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Makes sense. Genesis 26, we see that Adonai affirms to Isaac, again, what he said to Abram, do not be Yare. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Yeah. I'm with you. After Jacob sees the ladder, when he was fleeing from Esau, yeah. It says that he was Yare. He was afraid. And I think, again, that's that combination of reverence yeah. and fear. The, and, and what's interesting, though, is that the first response of Israel here in Exodus is that they were afraid. They were terrified. After they watched God do this amazing miracle of deliverance, they've watched the plagues. You had plagues yeah. four through ten that didn't even affect them. Right. That they were never even touched by. They've seen this incredible, leave. they had plunder given to them, the silver and the gold and clothing. All of this has happened, yet the first sign, God knew their heart. He knew yeah. if I send them the, the northern yeah. route, yeah, they're, done. They're, go, they're not going to make it. Yeah. And they were. He, they proved right God knew their heart. And Sherry, this makes a lot of sense for all of us, doesn't it? Because in a lot of ways... When we come to Messiah, when mm -hmm. we when we're going through any kind of difficult times, our first response typically is to be afraid. Our first mm -hmm. response is to have some fear in our heart to kind of think about what are we going to do, and and we have patterns. You know, mm -hmm. our brains and our minds, our neurology, if you will, has a pattern, has a habit, the way that we think. Well, Israel had a habit; they had a way they've been thinking for hundreds of years now they're in the desert and they're following this cloud but they've all of a sudden been attacked by their oppressors right mm -hmm. and they immediately turn in their mind to the pattern uh, we can think of this in modern times when we've had a traumatic experience and then we kind of get healed or move away from it but all of a sudden we have something that's similar to it we hear a song we smell a, a, an aroma or an odor we have a conversation and somebody's reminiscent of it yeah. and it can make our brain want to go back to that pattern and that's where they are they fall right. into that pattern again well it's comfortable because it's where they had their basic needs met they did have food and shelter yeah and they didn't actually really have to think for themselves a whole lot because they were enslaved, but they've forgotten the right. cruelty of what slavery That's looks right. like. And so they complain, and they're like, we would rather have died in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here? And I love how Moses responds to them. Because yeah. if you've ever had anybody come to you complaining about stuff, you know, you want to get and fix it all and, and say, oh, but I'm don't I'm a fixer. Don't That's worry what I about, do. Right. Don't worry about I hear a problem. I'm sorry. And, Sherry will tell you. I hear a problem. Oh, what's wrong, baby? Oh, let me just go ahead and solve that for you. That is me. I'm a fixer. But Moses doesn't engage their conversation. He doesn't go and say, no, don't you remember you were enslaved? Yeah. Don't you remember how bad it was? Don't you remember how good God was? He redirects their mind. Yeah. He is trying to help them renew their mind around this idea of who God is. And here's what he tells them. He says, don't be afraid. He speaks to the fear. He doesn't engage the fear. He speaks to it. Don't be Yahweh. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Stand still. 
Yeah, this is uh, chapter 14, verse 13. Stand still and see the salvation of Adonai. Now, that mm. word salvation is Yeshua. Mm -hmm. See the salvation of Adonai, which he will perform for you today. You have seen these Egyptians today, but you will never see them again, ever. Adonai will fight for you while you hold your peace. Yeah. And as I was reflecting on this verse, it made me think, I wonder if Paul had this in mind yeah. as he's pinning Ephesians 6, 13 mm. through 17 in the armor of God. When he tells us to, after having done everything, yeah. to stand, stand firm. Yeah. This is Moses' instruction to them. He tells us in putting on the armor that we're to guard our mind. What does mm. Moses say? Rethink your mind. Look in a different direction. Don't think about what, what you're thinking about. Don't look at the fear. Look at, look at who God is. Walk mm. in peace. Hold your peace, he says. Yeah. And we know later in um, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it reminds us that the peace of God will do what? It guards your mind and our hearts in salvation, in Messiah, in Messiah Yeshua. Yeshua. It's all connected as one book, one story. Yeah, we have to think about that. And, and it's interesting. One of the translations uh, actually says it this way in Exodus, where he says um, uh, to hold your peace. Then one of the funnier translations says, just calm yourselves down. Yeah. <laughs> which calm, I think, which, calm it down. Calm it down. Calm it, calm it down. down. Which I think is hilarious. But there is that place where we let our brains jump into a fear-based pattern, and we don't let the salvation of God guard our minds or mm. guard our hearts, and we get really um, out of sorts. We get tense mm. and jangly and all kind of. And there is a place to say, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm, calm down. down. Well, just, I think just calm down. Well, if we juxtapose these two passages, we also see that as we talked about, they're in battle array. Yeah. They're in formation. They've got the weapons. They've got what they need. But it was their heart that's not in battle array. Yeah. This gets the heart in battle array. Yeah. Peace, trust, standing, guarding. That's what gets us ready for the battles yeah. and the warfares that we're going to face. Now, the Lord, of course, does a little different approach. Right. So Moses comes and he addresses the fear, mm -hmm. and rightly so, I think. I think he does the right thing, and and I and and he's he's trying to help them see the difference of what the Lord is. The Lord, on the other hand, comes in with a little different approach. He tells Moses. The Lord comes to Moses and he says these words. The Lord said to Moses, this is verse fifteen, "Why do you cry to me? <laughs> Tell the people of Israel." Get going. Go yeah. forward. Move on. In yeah. other words, he says, the Lord comes and says, okay, you bunch of whiners. Why are yeah. you whining? Quit it. Look, I just did all these miracles. Yeah. I've got all this stuff going on before you. You've seen it. I got a cloud out here. My goodness. Have you, have you not been paying attention the last three days? Look at this. Now, why are you crying? And the Lord has kind of taken the approach, which I think some of us need to realize, we spend a lot of time analyzing our victimhood, mm. our trauma, our fear. We spend a lot of time going, why do I hurt? And I hurt because of this and I hurt because of that. And there comes places in our life, and you got to balance this, of course, but there comes places in our life where the Lord just says, you're focused on the wrong thing. Yeah. Just why are you even thinking about this? Time to go. Get up and go. If you'll just go, everything will be fine. Quit pouting about well, stuff. Well, and it's here that Moses, God knows Moses has everything he needs. Yes. He's got the staff, the authority. Yeah. He's got the faith. He's got everything he needs, and he tells him, use that now and move forward. Move and this on really forward. is the Hebraic way of thinking, right. frankly. If you read the Bible through a Hebraic eyes, what you're going to find out is faith is always about action. It's always about doing. It's always about making something go on. And the Lord is saying, look, I didn't create you to sit here and analyze all the ifs, ands, pros, cons, buts, whiffs, whatever. I, I, I brought you out of Egypt. I delivered you. I got a cloud. I got a fire. You got a staff. Let's go. Right. Let's get on it. Make it happen. And then God does a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Another beautiful strategic thing for warfare. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 19 that the angel of God, yep. who had gone before them, 
now moved and went behind them. Wow. He became their rear guard. And why behind them? Because Egypt is pushing in on them, and the sea is in front of them. So now he goes behind them. And then it also says that the cloud moved from in front of them and stood behind them. Wow. So they have the Lord behind huh. them, and they have this cloud behind them. <laughs> and a very unique thing happens. Yeah. It declares that... The, uh, they came uh, in verse 20 and so came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel there was the cloud and the darkness over here where Egypt yeah. was and it gave light by night over there neither one came near each other so Israel still got light they're in the light and Egypt is in darkness. Boy, oh boy, that'll and preach. Come on. And what a beautiful picture of what spiritual warfare looks <laughs> like. It. When we are aligned with God, yeah. no matter what oceans we're facing, no matter what yeah. mountains we're facing, no matter what enemies behind us, when God is our shield and God is our rear guard, we have nothing to be afraid mm. of. Because he is behind us. He is going to keep our enemy in confusion. Yeah. He's going to keep our enemy hidden from yeah. us and us hidden from him. And then we see the great miracle happen where Moses does step out, puts his staff in the water, and the waters divide. And I think, Sherry, on this light and darkness thing, one of the things that we should recognize is that in spiritual warfare, where your eyes are is where you're going to find your joy, your happiness, your strength. Yeah. And we see that you got to put your mind, we talked about that a minute ago, you got to put your mind on the things of God, right? So that he knew the Egyptian, the uh, Israelites would not watch darkness. Mm. What would they watch? So he puts the cloud, he blocks it off. So now in the darkness, here's the encouragement to us today. Don't look at darkness. Yeah. When you see your problem, you're only seeing your problem. You need to see your problem solver. You need to look to the light. Don't look to the darkness. Don't focus your energy. Let's say, for example, you're going through a financial crisis. You're going through something hard. You can sit there all day and bemoan the financial crises. Look at the debt. Look at the shortfall. Look at how much money I'm not going to make. Look at my job problem. Look at this. And you can just look, look, look at all the negative and all that. That's the darkness. Or you can turn your attention to the God who is your provider, mm -hmm. the God who is your source, the God who puts a rear guard behind you and goes before you and orders your steps mm -hmm. as a righteous child of his. That's good. If you focus on the light, you begin to get solutions. If you focus on the darkness, you end up going back to the right. darkness. That's exactly right. So now Israel moves forward through this miraculous parting of the sea. They go on, the word says dry ground, which I think is a great distinction yeah. because you know it's muddy in the bottom of an ocean or rivers and lakes. Yeah. So it instantly became dry to where they could walk on it with their cattle, with their feet, with, and without sinking, with horses. And so they cross over. Of course, Pharaoh in his pride and arrogance say, we've got to get them. Yeah. Don't let them get away. Yeah. And he pursues after them. And we know this. The, of course, if you've ever seen the movie or read the story, you yeah. know that water. once Israel gets across, God pulls the waters back down and it crashes in on Pharaoh. Now, think about this. Yeah. This was Pharaoh and his officials. Yeah. This is a wipeout of Egypt. For a lot of, for you know, they, they've let, been left in famine. They, their land has been destroyed. Now their king, their leader is gone, and the royal court. So the this is, a, is the Lord. The victory is the Lord's. And, <laughs> and so because of that victory, Sherry, we move into chapter 15, and yes. we get what's called the Song of Moses. Then Moshe and the people of Israel sang this song to Adonai. I will sing to Adonai, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he threw in the sea. Yep. Verse 2, Yahweh, or Yah, is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua. He has become my salvation. Yes. This is my God. I will glorify him. My Father's God, I will exalt him. And the song goes on and on. It's a beautiful song. I encourage you to, to read the whole thing, meditate on it. But a couple things we just want to point out as we're wrapping up this particular uh, commentary on this part of the Parsha. There's three kind of big pieces here. One, he is our strength. Yes. And here we see that our strength must be in the Lord, which means we must surrender. Mm. I would just tell you today, surrender, surrender, surrender. Then he becomes your strength, just like they had to find yeah. out when they crossed the sea. Okay. Second, he becomes, it says, uh, he is our song. He is my song. Now, that's an interesting choice there. Why would he be my song? Well, 
We find out that music is very powerful. Music has something that stirs the soul. I must admit, Sherry, and I think, well, we've been here, you know, over three decades, so you know quite a bit about me, but, uh, I mean, I love music, yeah. right? Uh, but there are days where I walk around with soundtracks in my head. I kind of live with <laughs> movie themes and soundtracks in my head. And there are days where Rocky's soundtrack is in my head. I'm the underdog, and I'm going for the fight, and I'm going to win, and I'm going to work hard. And there are other days where I am uh, more like uh, Batman, and I'm uh, techno, and I'm smart and rich, and I've got that thing going on where I'm going to be the hero. There are days I'd like to be Superman, but I'm not much, right? <laughs> and there are days where other so songs have a way of kind of Mar giving marching orders to us, right? And Moses is saying, Lord, you became our strength in a way that we could not have imagined. And now, you literally are the song of our soul. What, it, what is in our bones mm. comes out as a melody. And it drives us and it makes us know things. There's a beauty in the song of the Lord. I encourage you today, find that thing in you that's the song of the Lord. And then he says, and you have become my salvation. Yeah. Sherry, what a word, right? I also want to touch on that song because this is really in some ways almost like a, a national anthem. Because this is right yeah. as they're coming out. They're a nation. They've just been delivered. And it was common when you conquered a land to, to create a song about it. That was yeah. a common thing. So they've now they're following in that same pattern. But this really becomes their national yeah. anthem. And this first two verses, because we see them again yeah. in Revelation, it really is... In essence, in some ways, a national anthem of the kingdom of God, not just the nation of Come Israel. So on. let's look at this. It says that um, where he says, you have become my salvation. That word salvation again is Yeshua. We see this again in Revelation 12.10. Then I heard a loud voice of heaven saying, now have come the salvation, Yeshua, yeah. and the power <coughs> and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his anointed one. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, we will no longer see again. Just like, we'll no longer see the Egyptians again. These it. Egyptians you see, you'll never see again. And it just sums it up, right? Our accusers, he, and of our brothers and sisters, the one yeah. who accused them before God day and night, has been thrown out. Yeah. This story is repeated again and again throughout yeah. history, and we even see it at the end of time when the Messiah comes back. Yeah. I think also we need to take note about my salvation. Yes. Because <clears throat> Abraham does refer to God as my, my Lord. But the patriarchs after that, Isaac refers to it as the God of Abraham. Jacob refers to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And throughout most, most of the, yeah. the recounting, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses says, this is my God. Mm. This is my salvation. You know, we don't live on the faith of our parents. Mm. We don't live on the, we build on it, but we don't live in it. He's got to become my salvation, yeah. my Yeshua T, my God. That's it. And when we go through the blood and we apply that blood over the doorpost of our hearts and we walk out of that prison we've mm. been in, out of the darkness and the cruel taskmaster of the accuser of the brethren, and we step in faith into the paths that God's leading us, even though they don't seem like the more direct paths, they're the ones that seem to be in the more treacherous place, mm -hmm. and we face our obstacles, this is when he becomes my God. Yes. No longer am I telling the stories of your glory, now he's my God. Amen. And this is the place that we want to be. And when we get to, to the end, when Yeshua returns, don't we want to look and go, that is my God. Amen. That's my Yeshua. That's my salvation. Amen. And so we're going to stop there today, and we want to encourage you to look at our other commentary where we're going to talk about in the same Parsha four big tests yeah. that are going to happen to Israel. And these four tests are really the four tests that we all go through, and they're the same ones yeah. they're facing now as they've passed through one of the red, they passed through the sea, they're on the other side. Now, more tests happen, four big ones. For this Parsha, we just say, may he become 
your salvation. Amen. So God bless you, and until next time, shalom. Shalom.